videos, we're going to talk about two different sensory theories. And the reason that we're going to talk about these theories is it'll help us get an understanding of how each individual's unique sensory systems can impact their perception of themselves and the environment, and how this in turn can impact their behavior and overall functioning. So the two theories are sensory integration theory, which we're going to talk about in this video, and sensory processing theory. They each overlap quite a bit, but they have some differences that we're going to briefly touch on in each of these videos. So again, the reason we're talking about these theories, although it's not important to know this, all the specifics of them, it just helps to provide a broader perspective into how someone's sensory systems can impact their behavior and functioning, and then what we can do to um, provide supports for those sensory needs. So sensory integration theory was developed by Jean Ayers in the 1970s. Sensory integration is defined as the brain's ability to organize sensory information that is received from the body and the environment. Um, it is important to note with sensory integration theory that this is the sort of the first theory of the sensory systems. And because it was developed so early, there's limited research on it because it kind of ended up branching into different schools of thought with different researchers. So this one is not super evidence-based and there's not a lot of research to back it. But it's essentially um, the brain's ability to organize sensory information received from the body and the environment. So the sensory systems that this pertains to is the ones that you're used to hearing, such as vision, hearing, taste, smell, touch, and then also proprioception and vestibular, which we're going to talk about in the next slide. Um, but essentially what happens during sensory integration is that the brain locates, sorts, and orders sensations for use to form perceptions, behavior, and learning. So here's where we're going to talk a bit more about the senses. You should be familiar with the main five senses, but then a big part of your sensory system is also vis your vestibular and proprioceptive senses. So what your vestibular sense is, is very related to your balance. Um, essentially what it does is detect your head movement through space. So that can be angular, linear, or rotating. And it works with proprioception and vision to regulate balance. So it really comes into play with balance, as I said, as well as posture and writing reactions. And so um, some examples, so I talked about angular, linear, or rotating movement of your head through space. So that could be angular might be going down a slide where your head's moving down at an angle. Linear would, could be running, rotating, is spinning. So examples of vestibular input would be um, running, jumping, going down a slide, swinging, jumping on a trampoline, just a lot of that movement that moves your head through space in different ways, gives you vestibular input because it's um, getting that input so that your body has to be able to balance and um, just understand and be able to maintain posture in those different positions. And then proprioception is your body's ability to sense its location, movements, and actions in relation to the environment and objects in the environment. So it's essentially where your joints, muscles, all your body parts are in space at any time and under your body knowing where that is without having um, that vision input. So examples of input for proprioception would also be running, jumping, but then you'll also have some weight-bearing activities such as crawling and push-ups, pushing and pulling um, heavy objects, lifting heavy objects, cardiovascular activities, deep pressure, hugs and squeezes, and chewing. So all of those are examples of proprioceptive input. So the overview of sensory integration in general, this kind of breaks down the steps where First, the sensations of our body and the environment around us are present. So you have visual input, hearing, um, touch, proprioceptive, vestibular, all of those. 
Your body detects the sensation and sends your input to the brain. The brain then locates, orders, and sorts the sensation for use. And once it does that, it can form perceptions and learning and behavior in response. And one um, example of behavior, a lot of times people's functioning can be talked about as their ability to adapt to different environments and senses. So that the behavior side of that is called your adaptive response, which is um, conducted in response to those perceptions formed by the brain. So an adaptive response is a purposeful, goal-directed response to a sensory experience. So an example would be if you are touching a hot surface, your adaptive response is to move your hand because you've gotten that input that is that the sensation is hot and so you pull away from it. So that would be an adaptive response. Or another example is if you have a toddler crawling around and they see a toy that they want, then their adaptive response is to crawl to that toy so that they can reach it. So that includes the crawling to it, the reaching for it, the grasping it, and um, all of that. But the actual response is not necessarily part of sensory integration. It's just the response to sensory integration. So this is called the pyramid of learning. It's not really necessary to memorize all the parts of it. This is just um, to help you understand how each individual sensory system is at the base of their higher functioning. So ultimately dysfunction in the sensory systems because they're at the base is what can cause dysfunction in the higher functioning systems. So you see the senses that we talked about at the bottom and how they can contribute to those higher functioning um, reflexes and posture, awareness, motor planning, and how that all leads to functioning and participation in daily activities such as self-care, like being able to go to the bathroom, a shower, and then just behavior in general. So you, I'll give this a second for you to look at it and kind of study how it how the different senses can affect those higher functioning. And feel free to pause if you want to look at this for longer. So dysfunction arises. Um, what you're going to see is this happens when the, when the brain does a poor job of organizing sensations. Then you may see slow learning or poor behavior and you can, might be able to notice that the child is over or under responsive to specific senses. So it does vary per sense. A child might be over responsive to touch, meaning that um, they're very sensitive to the tags on their clothing. So they have a really hard time wearing certain pieces of clothing because of the tags or the texture. So that's being over responsive. Or you may see that they're under responsive. So that would be um, if you're under responsive to tactile or touch sensations, they could have mess all over their hands and it doesn't really phase them and they don't really notice it. Um, and that can vary sense by sense. And then you may also notice in a dysfunction of organizing sensations, less skillful play, missing details, which comes with that under responsiveness, avoiding toys that require manipulation, trouble making and keeping friends and being um, easily distracted. And then some other impacts that you may notice from that dysfunction in the sensory systems would be in social skills, which these you can all relate back to that pyramid that we looked at. This is just kind of reiterating that. You can see deficits in task performance, coordinated motor movement, ability to plan and sequence tasks, um, ability to participate in self-care, and decreased participation in family activities. And then so a few things that you can do is it's just good to have an understanding of how a child's sensory systems may be impacting their cognition and behavior. Um, but it's important to know the environment can only be modified to a certain extent. So that is something that you should do, but there's other things that you can do as well. The big thing is communicate with parents to understand the sensory needs of their child. Just, again, have that knowledge and do your research and be aware. And through that communication, you may know better what to look for. But um, some things you can look for, if a child is overstimulated, they may appear hyperactive, distracted, hostile, aggressive, withdrawn, or weepy. So when you notice those things, remember 
how children perceive things differently. Modify the environment as much as you can. Um, some senses that may be organizing to that child, you can know from communication with that parent. Or some examples might be if they have um, a favorite furry toy or blanket. Some other organizing senses might be hugging. Um, if you give them a hug or if they're not comfortable with that, encouraging them to give themselves a hug and getting that proprioceptive input can be organizing to them. A rocking chair can provide some vestibular input, some back rubs if they're okay with that. And if you do that, making sure that you're rubbing down their back rather than up because that can, um, the tactile input of the hair going the opposite way might be difficult. Um, some other things that we've talked about previously, wiggle seats, foot fidgets, weighted vests, arm squeezes, just whatever works for them, what input that they like that is organizing to them after you've modified the environment as much as possible. Um, outdoor activities can provide a lot of proprioceptive input that can help them calm down. So if they're really seeking that movement and wanting to crash into things, then giving them a space where that's more appropriate, such as a playground where they're able to go down slides and run around in the mulch and fall down in the mulch and such. And then finally, just providing structure, clear expectations, organized activities and environments and reinforcing good behavior will all help um, to not overload a child's sensory system. So this was Jean Eyre's sensory integration theory. Next, we're going to talk about Winnie Dunn's sensory processing theory.